Welcome to the Power of Music podcast. Brought to you by JM International. Get ready to explore conversations with those making a difference through music. Hello and welcome everyone to the Power of Music podcast provided to you by JMI, Jeunesse Musicale International. A global network of NGOs that empowers young people through music across all boundaries. Today, we are recording from the Future Music Forum in Barcelona, Spain, in a series recorded during this amazing conference. My name is Ricardo, and I'll be your host. And for this episode, I'm joined by Danny Deal. Danny is a Chicago-based EDM and house music producer, DJ, journalist, and head of communications and creator insights at BandLab. Hey, Danny Deal. Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. First, what has been your journey into well, the music industry? Mm. It's been a long journey. I also think that a lot of people don't find the music industry, but the music industry finds mm. you. And that's what happened to me in high school, mostly because I had a really hard time finding my tribe or who my people were growing up. In school, it was really difficult for me to make friends. I often felt like I was an outcast. I didn't know where I fit in. And quite literally, all of that changed the first time I went to a rave. And I thought this was also, by the way, before raves were cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a strange warehouse in the middle of nowhere. But I walked in and immediately thought, oh, this is where my mm. people are. And so by proxy, I fell in love with the music that was associated with raves. And being in Chicago, that meant falling in love with Mozzie and Paul Johnson and Frankie Knuckles and Derek Carter and all of these amazing house giants that really built the foundation for most of dance music that we listen to today. And I just happened to live in the thick of it. So I became a DJ as a result of that and then started getting into music production and then started to get into writing, wound up working for places you might have heard of, like DJ Mag and Nylon, and then eventually The Verge, and then fell into the music tech side of things. And currently, I am at BandLab Technologies as their head of comms and creator insights, and I will put a semicolon in that because I'm still a DJ and producer as well. Can you maybe say something about that? first experience like you said like trying to find your tribe and then you go in there and that's it like how how did you know it was that or what was the magic maybe i i really hope this doesn't come across as cheesy but you know how with raves there is that mantra of blur peace love unity respect and so it was one of the first times where i walked into a large space filled with a lot of people and i felt welcomed i felt like people were making space for me i felt like People were extending their hand. I was so used to being ignored all the time at school just because I was deemed the dork, the nerd, the weird art kid that didn't fit in anywhere. And also the schools I went to were quite small. My graduating class for grade school was probably a couple dozen people. And then in high school, it was 93. So if you didn't fit in, there was nowhere for you to hide. And so it was a, a really opposite experience for me to go from well, no one likes me and I have no place to hide mm -hmm. to finding a whole room of people that didn't know me, but wanted to get to know me. And how much of that do you think is because of the music itself? Oh, well, that's really interesting. I don't know. I, yeah, I suppose it goes, it has to go hand in hand because I wouldn't have fallen in love with the music if it wasn't for the culture that I associated with it. But I think that's really that's true of a lot of movements, right? Like um, people who are into punk, or they they embody punk because it's not just about the music, right? It's about the the social component and what you wear to signal to other people that you listen to the same things, right? Um, it's the same for for many genres of music. The music itself is just one portion of it, and it's really about social movement. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's definitely true. And then it becomes a sort of almost an identity for a lot of people. Can you then say a bit about how your DJ career came out of that? And like, what kind of music were you playing? These kind of, or are you playing? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. The 
the DJ portion also happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I started amassing records. I remember very specifically, and I will always remember it because I have a tattoo of the waveform on the back of my neck, but the first record that I ever purchased was Mojo Lady Hear Me Tonight, which is a very classic house track. And so I would cart all of my records over to a friend's house who had a pretty good turntable system so I could practice. We had turntables at my house, but they were belt drive and so they were kind of trash. And I wanted to practice on direct drives. Uh, and then one of my friends thought that I was good enough to play out. And so they booked me for a party without telling me about it because they knew <laughs> that I wouldn't have the courage to seek it on my own. And uh, that was a, a really a really uh, brave thing for them to do because a lot of people maybe would not have taken that so kindly, but I have a really hard time saying no to things. And I also like to rise to challenges. So the combination of those two things made it so that I was really eager to jump into the opportunity. Uh, and I wound up being a very, very random party in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. Like literally there was one bar in a three mile radius of this place and it was an abandoned hunting lodge. <laughs> and I distinctly remember my hands shaking because I was so nervous putting that first record on and I couldn't beat match and I ran out of record. It's like every DJ's worst nightmare <laughs> other than pressing stop on the table that's live. And uh, the crowd started chanting my name. They knew it was my first gig and they were like, try again, do it again, Danny, go again. And I was like, this is amazing. Like the, the fact that they were not only welcoming of me, but they knew that this was a challenge and they were all here to help me overcome, uh, overcome this and to reach a goal. I was like, the, this is the path that I must continue on. And uh, yeah, so I, I've been hooked ever since, and I've never had that problem again. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do they still change your name? <laughs> <laughs> it happens a little bit, <laughs> but it's it's really it's been wild. I've been able to play at Lollapalooza many times. Uh, one of my favorite gigs was opening up for Fall Out Boy in uh, Wrigley Field. That was pretty special as a DJ. A lot of very very few DJs have ever played in Wrigley Field. That was pretty phenomenal, and it's taken me all over the world. That's fantastic. So then can we go a bit into the tax side and how did you marry these two women? Mm. I think by the very nature of being interested in electronic music, I'm already interested in tech. Mm. So very specifically, I think in dance music, there's the preconception that if you're going to make dance music, you do it all. Whereas in other genres like pop or hip hop or indie rock, whatever, everyone has their part to play, but you wouldn't expect a guitarist in an indie rock band to be able to also write the top line and also master the track and do all of these things. Whereas in dance music, most people, there's the expectation or the self-expectation that you would be able to write the track, uh, be able to mix it down, be able to engineer it, master it, like do everything. And so I did. So I learned it all. And I got really specifically interested in the mixing and uh, mastering side of things. I loved it. I am not so great at writing the catchy parts of songs. And so that's why I think most of my credits are in remixes, which then leads to production and engineering credits. Uh, so yeah, I was I was a dork. <laughs> and I, so once again, I was like, oh, this music serves me well. Uh, it aligns with my interests in so many different ways. So I was already in the tech. And then so by the time I transitioned into actually working for the tech companies themselves, it was not a far leap at all. It it wasn't a leap. I was already there. I I started uh, with Output, which makes plugins and many of the plugins I was already using by the time I started there. And uh, with BandLab, it's, it's all stuff I'm super familiar with. It's samples and, uh, and DAWs and just music making goodness so yeah it was very easy can you tell a bit well what band lab actually is for the listeners that are maybe not familiar and sure i do yeah band lab is a social music making platform and i know that sounds incredibly vague but <laughs> let's unpack that a little bit so uh, much like you would have garage band on your iphone which is a free music making platform 
BandLab is a free music making platform that exists for all sorts of operating systems and devices. So you can have it on iPhone. You can also have it on Android. Um, it's free. It has a DAW, which is a digital audio workstation, which for people that are not in music sounds scarier than it actually is. Basically, just is a place where you can create music. So it has that as a core uh, experience, which is free and will always be free. And then there's all sorts of goodies that are added onto that. There's uh, there's a, a samples marketplace. All the samples are free to use and are also royalty free, which means that you can use them in your track without the fear of penalty for using somebody's material without permission. And then there's also a distribution, there's artist services, there's the ability to uh, collaborate live with other people, which is so fascinating and interesting. Computationally, that just was not a thing that was available even five years ago. And now in BandLab, you can collaborate with up to 15 people on the same track. So oh. I could get yeah, like live with someone else be working on the same track, which is oh. nuts. Uh, there's also an AI component, which I know a lot of people are like, oh, scary music and AI. But the, our AI called Song Starter has a lot of guardrails around it to make sure that it is always going to be human led. So it's meant for people who have blank canvas syndrome. If you want to get an idea going, mm -hmm. but you don't really know where to start, you can give it some semblance of words. I, I don't know. I would like a uh, funky poolside uh, house track that sounds like it's from Miami. And it will give you three options. And then you can, if you like one of those options, you can open it directly in studio. And I cannot emphasize this enough. It is short. It is only a few bars and it is MIDI. It is not audio. So it is meant to be a point of inspiration. Uh, and we've looked at the data for that. And it's fascinating because we find that when people use song starter as their entry point versus any other entry point in studio they're 80 percent more likely to publish a finished track really yeah so we can actually see that the oh, ai wow. is working as a tool to help creatives as a kind of inspirational co-create well it's not really co-creative as an inspirational tool yes yes that's wonderful mm -hmm. and especially for the people that are worried about ai yeah. this is a nice use case of the opportunity that it provides as well exactly and I saw your talk here at the Future Music Forum or the panel you were part of, and I kind of heard you have a large number of tracks being generated each month. Mm -hmm. What kind of people are using it? And by that, I mean, is it mostly enthusiasts or is it professional musicians or semi? Or like, do you have some insights on that? I can make a guesstimation. We haven't done a formal survey of our users. I, I can tell you that they're young, that about two thirds of our users are under the age of 24. I can tell you that they're global. Uh, they are truly all over the place, which is uh, quite wonderful, I think, because we're entering into this era of global localization. You might have heard the term globalization <laughs> <laughs> thrown around as a buzzword once or twice. Uh, in terms of where they are, I think the, the interesting thing about BandLab is that, one, it is very easy for people who have never gotten into music to be able to get into music with BandLab. And then also it can serve as a point in the creative journey for people that are already making music and are at a professional level. So myself, for example, Ableton has pretty much always been my DAW of choice. And I use BandLab here or there uh, to capture ideas because it is mobile and Ableton is obviously not mobile. Uh, but I will generally take the track and finish it in Ableton. And BandLab has this ethos, which is very different to a lot of other companies where it's like, we don't really care if we're the zero to 100 solution for everything in your creative process, so long as we're here to help. Mm. Um, and so by that very nature, we get people from all kinds of journeys, all kinds of creative walks of life, people who are at zero, people who are at 100. But I think a large portion might be the people that are in that zero to 15% of their career. Um, and we're happy to be that entry point for all of these people that are discovering that they can too get into music, just like all of the people that they look up to. If you look at the really fast or rapidly changing technical landscape in the digital world, what are you in particularly excited about, maybe in relationship to this platform specifically or just in general? I 
I think what's really exciting is the fact that so many more people are going to be able to access music making in general. I think you heard me talk about this earlier, but I dislike that a lot of the times we talk about music making only through the lens of commercialization. When in reality, the commercialization of music is is a modern phenomenon that has only been around for a few generations. And before that, music was a service and it was something that anyone could get into and you didn't have to feel ashamed if you weren't as good as Ed Sheeran or Taylor Swift, right? You could just do your thing and maybe play the piano at a party and (laughs) that was good enough. And we've placed all of these uh, gatekeepers around it. And so suddenly you are either a hobbyist or you're aspiring to make money or you make money. And where is that space in the middle? Because we don't do the same thing to sculpture and we don't do the same thing to drawing. We don't do the same thing to painting or cooking or knitting or whatever creative endeavor you can think of. Well, and especially I love that I think in the panel or after the panel, there was somebody that said, I don't know how many, 20 years ago before the mobile phone, people were taking pictures were either hobbyist or professional photographer that had the equipment. And now everyone can be a photographer and can publish it on social media. And no one's going to be like, whoa, are you aspiring photographer? No, you're just sharing your photos, which are part of your life. And they can be of you, but they can also be of the beautiful landscape you see. And why can that not be a beautiful soundscape? And did and did Instagram replace the professional photographer? No, no, of course not. <laughs> it did not. And, and so I think that what's really exciting is that we are seeing the highway of music get expanded to the superhighway and we're seeing that additional lanes are being created and there are more pathways not to success i want to be very clear that not everyone is, should be wants to be will be an artist with a capital a but there is just space to enjoy and to engage with music simply because you enjoy it is enough 100%. and how crazy that that is the revelation yeah and I think also a red thread here in the episodes that I recorded here at the FMF is I talked with a few previous guests about the kind of participatory element that music used to have mm. and also the difference in, in listening and hearing. And I think a lot of people are just hearing music now. Yes. And I think that solutions like these are great to for people. And I, I don't want to be still people to get a music education. And if you can go to a music school or learn an instrument, of course, but for people that is not a given because they don't have the resources or the equipment, or they come from a place where that's not possible or from a background where that's not supported, this can be a very accessible and beautiful solution to still have that participatory element to learn, to listen again, like, Oh, what did I just make? And what happens when I press here? And what happens when I do this? Oh, and that's music. And I think that's yeah really relevant. I think that's really beautiful because To your point, is more music being listened to than ever before or is more music being consumed Mm. than ever before? Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. And And I I would argue that more music is being consumed. Yeah. Yeah, and increasingly secondarily. Mm -hmm. Like you watch a video and there's music in the background. You play a video game and there's music in the background. And it's not necessarily good or bad, but it's different. Yeah. Well, and also I think a lot of the ways that we consume music have removed the element of curiosity that we used to have to have in order to seek out what we liked. Yeah. And I used to have to, for example, take a bus to go to the record store every mm-hmm. single week and dig to fi- and listen to every single record and see what I liked. And maybe I had enough money and maybe I didn't. And I would hide a couple records for next week. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that element of discovering on your own, the element of... Uh, needing to have curiosity in order to find out what you like and what that informs about yourself has by and large been taken out of the context of music uh, to, I think, the listener's detriment. Yeah. I'm curious if there's any studies uh, on whether our accessible to cameras and just photos have actually makes us look look better like Mm. not just see but like look and observe like oh that's a beautiful horizon i want to take a picture maybe that there's something to say that that could be the same for music if you got kind of involved in that co-creative process again oh i see what you're saying so by the very fact that everyone can take a photo it means that you're actually you're viewing the world differently potentially potentially just a thought i don't know if there's any studies on that no i like where you're going (laughs) 
Because it, it means that you are then engaging with the world around you in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe if people have access to, like you said, connecting the dots here, participating in the music making process in a exactly. way that feels accessible to them, then it might affect the way that they listen to music. Yeah. Because they understand to a degree what it takes to get some, okay. All right, Maybe. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> for the the company specifically, what is the vision for the coming years? I think the the vision is very aspirational. The vision is there should not be any boundaries mm. to making music. You should not be out of the process of making music simply because you don't have the right phone, simply because you live in an underserved community simply because you live in a place that doesn't have access to music education. There are so many blockages, depending on where you live and what you have access to, that prevent people from being able to make music. I mean, fundamentally, also, instruments are expensive, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, music theory is very difficult to learn. I, as someone who took theory in college, uh, so there's there's all these, there's all of these barriers that, exist and our mission is what if we burned it all down and made it so that everyone had the same opportunity as everyone else to create music wonderful wonderful if people want to find you or connect with you or where can they find you where can they find everything that we're talking about yeah the company is Band Lab, B A N D L A B. You can find them on all socials. And me personally, I am D A N I D E A H L, Danny Deal, also on all socials. Very, we're both very easy <laughs> to find. <laughs> That's good. As always, the very last question What is the power of music? Oh, gosh. Uh, the power of music is as large as changing the direction of an entire generational movement and it is as small and powerful as somebody being able to identify who it is that they are and what they stand for it is it touches every individual heart and it touches generations of people and movements it is the biggest and smallest thing that we have thank you so much that's beautiful thank you very much for listening if you want more information about jm or you would like to get involved, visit www.jmi.net. At JMI, we are on a mission to make the world more musical. That's why we created Mubazar, a digital platform that helps us manage all our musical activities across 80 countries worldwide, connecting musicians with opportunities to grow both personally and professionally. If you are a music professional looking for a better way to manage and promote your music activities, check out Mubazar. Created for music organizers, by music organizers, Mubazar allows you to run music competitions, workshops, camps, auditions, masterclasses, awards, events, and much more. Mubazar offers custom application forms, payments for your activities, jury tools, translations, analytics, and more. Mubazar is fast becoming the best place for musicians to find and apply for music opportunities online, and you can sign up today for a free organizer account by going to www.mubazar.com. Registering and then requesting to upgrade to an organizer on the right-hand menu. For more info, don't hesitate to get in touch via support at mubazar.com. It would mean a lot to us if you could give us one minute of your time and rate and review the podcast. In case you have any suggestions or would like to be one of our next guests, feel free to reach out to us through the JMI socials. Mm -hmm.